Economic analysis has for decades operated largely on the assumption that people are rational actors who make rational decisions. Public policy has often shared that assumption, but fresh thinking from the increasingly prominent field of behavioral economics has other ideas for better policy in both sectors. Joining us now to explain, Supriya Seal. She is former chief behavioral scientist for the Privy Council Office of the Government of Canada. Dilip Soman, he is professor of marketing at BEAR, that's the Behavioral Economics in Action at Rotman at the University of Toronto. And Mike Moffat, director of policy and research at the Think Tank Canada 2020 and assistant professor at Western University's Ivy Business School. And it is great to welcome you three. Mike, back to TVO and you two for the first time. Uh, nice to have you here. Maybe I could get you just to start off because uh, I'm not sure everybody understands the distinction between so-called regular economics and behavioral economics. What's the biggest difference? I'm going to go back to language that was first used in uh, Richard Thaler's book, uh, Nudge. He talked about two kinds of entities. He talked about econs, which are the super rational people. They, they are smart. They think about the future. They are you know, uh, unemotional, uh, and then there's people like us. Uh, there's people who are mm -hmm. impulsive, there's people that forget stuff, there's people that don't really care about the future as much as they should. And so I think what ends up happening is behavioral economics is a science that treats humans as humans, as opposed to humans as these super smart entities. And one of the big challenges we face in, in policy making and business is, is I think we end up designing policy and welfare initiatives and programs for econs when in fact the end users are human, and that mm. creates a big, a big challenge. It feels though, Supriya, that for 150 years in Canada, we have basically brought traditional economic perspectives to bear when we make policy. Why in your view is that not adequate to the task anymore? Because there are humans on the other side of that policy. I mean, ultimately, you know, we're in the business of designing for people. We're trying to make policy or programs or services that people are going to access, and the attempt is to help them in some way lead better lives. If we don't do that with an understanding of how people actually make decisions, or how people actually behave, whatever we, we build is going to fall short in driving that behavior or driving that positive change for people. And this is where behavioral insights becomes really important in the context of policy, because we're saying, hey, you know, we're building public policy. Let's think about the public. <laughs> like, what a radical idea. What a novel idea. idea. Yeah, radical. Yeah. Radical idea. But I'm guessing, Mike, when you went to university, not that many years ago, no. quite frankly, you're a fairly young guy, uh, you know, the economics that you would have taken, and maybe in high school as well, was kind of traditional easy as she goes, regular economics, right? Oh, oh ba absolutely. So I, I was a student in the, in the 1990s, so we were all about uh, neoclassical economics, but, which had these sort of behavioral assumptions that were all rational, uh, you know, utility maximizing individuals. And in many cases, we are. And I think that what behavioral economics kind of brings to the table is these situations where we deviate from the traditional model. So I don't think it necessarily has to be sort of one or the other. It's just having another tool in our toolkit uh, in order to design better policies to get the outcomes we want at, at the lowest possible cost. So just so I'm clear, you're not saying we've got to check out everything we've been doing for the last 150 years and and turn a whole new page. Is that right? Yeah, no, no, I, I, absolutely. I mean, there's, you know, people, they might not be fully rationally, you know, uh, maximizing, but they do sort of follow some presets. You know, if interest rates go up, all else being equal, people will tend to save more. Mm -hmm. So those types of things. So it's just, it's using the right tool. And, uh, you know, the, the traditional models are simple, you know, which is a uh, drawback, but it's it, it also helps in some, in some cases where it's, you know, you just, you know, having a back of the envelope type answer does work in some, in some situations. Dilip, I wonder if you could just sort of take us through an example of, I mean, one of the things we've learned from behavioral economics is the fact that markets and humans do not always behave rationally. Give us an example of this. So I'll actually build on something that Matt just spoke about, uh, the, the idea that Economics gives us good sort of, you know, general direction in terms of what people do and don't. Uh, I make a distinction between what we should do, and I think that's something that economics informs us, but how we should do it, that's something that behavioral economics is much better at doing. So a few years back, uh, our federal government launched something called the Canada Learning Bond, uh, $2,000 worth of 
quote unquote, free money for eligible low income Canadians. And I remember being in the room when it was launched when one of the economists said, well, it's free money, who wouldn't take it? Well, guess what? 84% of Canadians did not take up that free money. How come? Uh, well, here's the thing. So when, when you first think about the fact that I've got this new offering that people aren't taking up, the, the knee-jerk reaction is, well, maybe people don't know about it. And so we spent a lot of time and energy and effort educating people. And it turns out that didn't work very well. Uh, the challenge was much more of an on-the-ground challenge. And, uh, you know, these were low-income Canadians. They were working two or three jobs. They didn't have the time to go and open an RESP account. Uh, many of them were embarrassed going into a bank. Many of them didn't speak the language. And so the solution wasn't to inform people. It wasn't to advertise. It was to actually solve that behavioral friction, which is to help people get to the bank and help them have that conversation with the banker. And, and once you address that, uh, that take-up problem goes away. So the, the policy was great. It was just the how that the behavioral economics informed. Uh, I think, it, if I can just build on that a bit, the, there was a, an example of that with the government of Ontario as well, where for years they've been trying to get people to go into you know, post-secondary programs uh, but that were designed to help people who couldn't afford them right. in the you know, lower stratas of society, the lower income households and so on, but they never picked up on it. No, but, that's exactly right. But then they called it free, and yes. now there's a quarter of a million people who've that's picked right. up on it. That's absolutely right. It I, just they had to hear that it was free. It was that. It was probably also the process that was used uh, yeah. for people. Yeah, difficult so, to so fill out the forms So it's those and all little that. things that actually make a difference at the end, and that's why behavioral insights plays, I hmm. think, a significant role. Supriya, so, when you were uh, in your time at the Government of Canada, the Privy, Privy Council office, uh, do you think that governments there got the message that humans don't always do the things that you expect humans to do when you are designing policies that may or may not have the end user in mind? Yes, I would say, I mean, the message I think is quite clear. I mean, it's also very, at the heart of it, a very intuitively accessible message, right? Like, let's think about people when designing for people. That's part one. Part two is let's, you know, let's actually if you're building something, let's actually test it on a small scale, do an experiment to see, does this work? Does this actually do what we're building it to do before we deploy it on a big scale? Or alternatively, if we've already built it, but it's not doing quite what we had hoped, let's go back and run some experiments to see, you know, can we make this better? And so these two core propositions, I think the message is quite clear. Uh, whether or not governments have the, the ability and the capacity and the will to actually execute on this message. That's sort of what we're trying to understand and help and deal with and, and, and hopefully, hopefully move the dial on. Let me pick up, Mike, on something that I think Dilip said a while ago. The word you used was nudge, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, in some respects, today's governments are not trying to get people to do things that are wildly different from you know, maybe what they have done. They want to kind of nudge them through policy levers into a what they believe will be a socially preferable option. Can you give us an example of something where government introduced a policy design just to sort of nudge people in a direction they thought was better for society? Yeah, so uh, state of Oklahoma uh, was having problems that, that people weren't taking their heart medications. And you would think that they would have all the incentives in the world to do so, because if you don't take this, you, you may die. Uh, and yet people weren't doing that. So they would uh, have all these times of little programs where, you know, if you would go in, and refill your prescription, you would get a $5 gift card. And you would think, well, the incentive for not dying is huge, where $5 is $5. Uh, but it, it caught people to actually fill in and, and, and uh, refill their prescriptions because they, they wanted that, that little carrot, that little uh, gift card. And it ended up saving uh, the state quite a bit of money because if people don't take their medications, they go to the hospital, that's, you know, that, that's an expense to their health care system. So these little tiny things of figuring out what motivates people, and it's not always the obvious thing. You would think not dying would be what the biggest motivator, but yeah, can, it's not always. Can you help us understand, how does that make any sense at all? You would <laughs> think not dying is all the incentive you need rather than a free you know, cup at Starbucks or something. Yeah, and I, I think it's one of these sort of issues with, with, with the medication. It's like, well, I feel fine now, so I don't, I don't really need to take the pills, right? The, the people tend to be a little sort of short-term focused, where, well, okay, if I stop taking this medication, I might have problems two or five or 10 years down the line, and I'm kind of busy today, and I've got a million and other, one other things to, to think about. So it's that you know, understanding that a lot of times we're very, very uh, short-sighted. We don't do the things that we're, we're supposed to do. We 
we don't always get to the gym. You know, sometimes, uh, yeah, you know, some, sometimes we're, we're having the, the, the greasy hamburger instead of the salad, you know, because we're just, we want something today and we're not necessarily thinking uh, down the road. Now, if you're making policy on behalf of, you know, the $300 billion government of Canada, you know, a $5 gift card at some place is not necessarily, if you've got uh, 25 letters after your name and you've been through all sorts of policy think tanks and so on, that's not necessarily going to be probably top of your list of policy options, is it? Mm -hmm. So how do we get people in the higher echelons of decision making to understand these little tweaks that can make all the difference? I think that's where behavioral scientists come in and that's where embedding behavioral insights as a practice and experimentation as a practice within government you know, plays a central role. So it's like, it, it's sort of this whole lens of evidence-based decision making where one, we're saying, you know, we need to have data, we need to have evidence for what we're going to do. We need to see at, when, we're, when we're solving for any given problem, right? Ultimately, policy making is a form of problem solving. Yeah. We're saying, okay, we're trying to fix X or Y or make something better. Uh, first of all, what do we know from other contexts where similar behaviors, you know, people have tried to solve for similar behavioral problems and what insights can be gleaned from there? Second of all, what data do we have to support that something like that would work in our context? Mm -hmm. Third of all, how do we actually execute it in our context? And then we go in and measure, well, did it work or did it not work? Or do we need to do further tweaks to see? So in that first step of this process, where you're looking to see, well, what have other people done? When you're thinking of policy as behavior specifically, then you'll be like, okay, well, so we're trying to, you know, get people to take their medicines in time, or get people to take, go get vaccinated, or get people to take a number of health-based decisions. What do we know? We know that people tend to be short-sighted. We know that people have a million things going on at any one point in time. We live in an attention economy where they might not be paying attention to the things that we think they're paying attention to. Mm -hmm. So how can we do something that you know, causes a moment of pause, maybe an inflection point, or something that we can do to get them to pivot and pay attention to this thing we're talking to them about? And that pivot is not necessarily a big you know, incentive or a big policy change. Often, it are, it's like these small tweaks of the kind that, that Mike just described that hmm. might get people to change their behavior. What, in your experience, is the biggest pushback against applying behavioral insights? It's a, it's a mindset thing, Steve. I mean, I, th I think for years and years, governments have kind of used traditional economics. Uh, they've used traditional levers like information or regulation. Uh, and, and this requires a completely different way of doing things. It requires people in the government to go out and actually talk to citizens. I mean, what a concept, right? <laughs> uh, or the humility that we probably don't know what's the best solution and therefore the need to experiment. And so a lot of the skill sets that are required to execute on the promise of behavioral economics are fundamentally very, very different. And I think that's the big challenge is, is, is once we can get people to uh, you know, understand the concept and, and to develop the, the, the practice of actually being experimental in their approach. I think it's a, you know, it, it's, it's a no-brainer that this will work, but I think uh, that's going to take time. Have you so, got a favorite example that you like to go to? Uh, several, actually. Uh, <laughs> but, but the one uh, that, that, that I want to talk about kind of builds on something that Supriya said, the, the idea that oftentimes we, we tend to look for solutions that have worked well elsewhere and just transplant them here. Uh, and it doesn't always work. One of the big lessons from behavioral economics is context dependence, is, is that results change dramatically as a function of context. You change the context slightly, and the outcomes are different. And so it's critically important to test, adapt, and then modify those solutions. So for example, uh, retirement savings. Right? We, we know from all over the world that one of the big challenges is that people don't empathize with their own future selves. And that's one of the big reasons why mm. we sort of don't, don't save enough for retirement. I mean, most people think about retirement savings as a black box into which they put money away that cuts away from their current consumption. And so a number of interventions in the UK trying to increase empathy with your own future self works like a dream. Now, we tried that in a project in Mexico, and that didn't work. Uh, and, and the reason it didn't work is because the culture in Mexico was much more of a family-oriented culture as opposed to an individual culture. So uh, people in Mexico don't want to think about their own future self. But when you 
change the messaging to get them to think about their family and what would happen to their family, that now all of a sudden it works. And so I think it's really important to pick the ideas. Ronald Reagan always said, trust but verify. <laughs> and I love that quote. I mean, it's, it's really trusting what others have done, but then actually testing it out uh, in, in our own backyard. Fascinating. I think that's Okay, Mike, let me get you in on this next part here, and this is going to take a bit of setup, so sort of humor me with this premise here. A big company wants to launch a new product. Let's say they want to create a new hot dog, and they want to make sure it's organic and, you know, free from any of the antibiotics that are used in cattle and all that kind of stuff. And, of course, it launches it, and then the company is going to monitor the launch and see how well it's done. It's going to get some feedback from the marketplace, maybe tweak the product this way a little bit just to make sure that it's, you know, working right. Or if it's not working right, they're going to kill it and try something else entirely. This is how the marketplace generally tends to, to roll things out. It, it, at least in my experience, it tends not to work that way in government. You know, governments don't iterate policies the way companies do with iPhones, that kind of thing, right? Um, they don't necessarily also do enough of the formal scrutiny or research that would tell you, yes, this really is working, or no, this really is not working. So at the risk of sounding ridiculous mm -hmm. here, how do we get governments to roll out policies in a way that is more like trying to sell hot dogs? Yeah, well, I, I think they're, they're trying to move in that direction with the sort of deliverology that uh, the Privy Council Office is doing. But I, I agree, it, it's a problem. I think one, one of the issues that, that, that you have is you have these sort of large management changes whenever, whenever you have an election. Uh, so, uh, you know, you, you, it's not like uh, in a company where you have a CEO and then three years later the opponent of that CEO is now, is now running the company. So there's a political aspect to it. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I think it's just a culture, the, a culture that needs to change where, you know, we, we, we talk about running uh, government more like a business and that tends to make me shudder a little bit. But here's a case where I actually think that would be helpful uh, of designing things a, a ahead of time where you think of, okay, what are we trying to accomplish with this policy and how do we know we have actually accomplished that? that in the past, when we do analysis, we kind of do the policy first and then we try and think through, okay, well, how would we actually measure success after we've already uh, enacted the policy? And the whole idea of deliverology, which the federal government's doing, saying, no, let's, you know, let's put all those metrics on the front end. Let's decide before we even enact the policy, what does success look like and how would we know if we've reached it? The feds, of course, got that idea from the Brits. Mm -hmm. It seemed to work for the Brits. And I don't know if the jury is out in Canada as to whether or not deliverology, as it's called, is working here. Do you know? Uh, well, I, I think it's still early to tell. Uh, I, what, what was it? It says on the, uh, the, the government's deliverology website, uh, underway with challenges, I think, is the, the terminology <laughs> yes. that they keep using. So, yeah, I would say in Canada, uh, deliverology is underway with challenges. Work in progress? Definitely work in progress. I mean, I, I, I want to pick up on one point that, you know, Mike was just making about uh, it, what is the deliverable, right? So in your example, the way government has worked traditionally, the, the deliverable is the sausage, not whether or not people actually buy the sausage. Mm. And we need that to be the deliverable. That I mean, is a fascinating <laughs> distinction. The right. deliverable is the sausage, not whether people actually want the sausage. And that's what it should be. Of course it should be. Right, they don't so think that way in government? They're starting to, but I don't. But it's 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 certainly not at the. It's certainly not percolated the entire system in in the way that it needs to. That being said, I'd say there are some some really nifty initiatives that are that are you know trying to get people to think this way. I mean, and 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 so, so I can I can I can speak to two of them. In fact, um, they're both out of the Treasury Board Secretariat. One of them is called Experimentation Works. And the purpose of experimentation works is twofold. One, to disseminate knowledge about how to actually do experiments. And the way they're doing this, instead of you know, it, providing this knowledge in abstraction, is actually helping a few different departments in government do an experiment that is related to their individual mandates. And, and so like learn by doing, so right. to speak. And then the second purpose is to document this, do it all out in the open so it can be replicated. To my mind, this is really ex excellent sort of initiative because you're building that capacity within government to start to think about whether or not people want the sausage as, as the deliverable that you're you know, reaching towards. 
Then the second initiative is called Talent Cloud. Hang on, before you go there, can mm -hmm. I just come back on that? Let me Please. gently push back on that a little bit. Okay. I'm not sure that works in government because, you know, in the private sector where you can do all that behind closed doors mm -hmm. and, and, you know, here's, here's version one and then version two and version three of our product and we'll, you know, we'll reiterate as we go through it and make it better to the point where when we finally get something out the door, that's great and then we'll improve it as it gets out there and that's why we've got how many versions of iPhone now? <laughs> I don't know, we have to 10 now or something? Anyway, in government, you can't afford to experiment because if the opposition gets brown enveloped on this, you are the subject of question period, you're on the front page of the newspaper the next day, and the whole idea is to embarrass whoever uh, led the experiment. Yeah. How, do you, how, do you, how do you have success in those kinds of circumstances? And I think this is, this, is, this is a great point because this is precisely where experimentation done right is in fact a risk mitigation strategy as opposed to you know, leading to the kind of risk <laughs> that you're describing. Because what we're saying is, Let's do something on a small scale. Let's do a pilot experiment to see if something works. If it doesn't work, we've just done it on a small scale. We can do things to make it better. Uh, in addition, I mean, we, we learn about what doesn't work, what fails. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, we won't replicate that. And we will not have a ginormous failure that'll blow up in our faces leading to the kinds of consequences that you're describing. Enormous is a technical term <laughs> from your, yes, I can see it. Okay, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. We're gonna do a second one as well. Oh, yes, so there's another initiative out of uh, the Treasury Board as well, and it's called Talent Cloud, and it's this really sort of nifty, it's, um, it's cross-sectoral um, grassroots initiative proposed by a, a group of really enthusiastic government servants, and what they're trying to do is use an experimental interface that's reimagining how talent is brought into the government. So what kind of mobility talent has. I mean, one particular objective is to bring in more diverse talent, but specific to the conversation we're having, it's also to bring in talent that has expertise in things like behavioral science or experimentation mm. so that you're helping change or bring about this cultural or mindset change that we're speaking to in this conversation. Apropos of what you just said, the province of Ontario right now has, I think, in three locations around Ontario, a basic income pilot program. They do indeed. Is that maybe an example of what Supriya was just saying, in as much as rather than lay it out for the whole thing? For sure. I think the idea is to start small, collect mm -hmm. feedback, kind of just like you said with the hot dog manufacturers, <laughs> is before you scale it up province-wide, why don't we test it at three locations? Why don't we get early feedback, iterate? And I think this whole test, learn, adapt methodology is the way to, way to think about policy going forward. I think there's a couple of things. One, I love the, uh, the hot dog language, so I'm going to continue that. <laughs> um, for governments to start experiment with hot dogs is fine. I don't think you want to start experimenting with immigration policy or, or, or you know, your, your budget or any of that stuff. But you know, how do I get people to file taxes online as opposed to on paper? That's, uh, that's an important seemingly small problem that has massive consequences for efficiencies, that's something we can experiment with because our baseline is that people are filing on paper. And so, you know, your experiment isn't going to cause any more damage than your current baseline. And so, so I think it's important to find, uh, you know, topics or, or areas where, you know, feedback is quick, you, fi you know, you run a pilot on, on tax filing, you know by the end of May what's happened. How did uh, they get people to do that? Well, to have more people filing online? essentially really making it easy. And I think the idea is if you make it easy and make it simple, people do it. Uh, so right now you go into your, uh, uh, your, your CRA account online and your, you know, your um, T4s are there and T4As are there and all yeah. you have to do is put in some basic data, pre-populated forms. So they don't have to give people $5 gift cards they to, to do that. They don't have to give uh, people $5 gift cards. To nudge them into doing That's it. That's right. Uh, but again, I think okay. the, the bottom line is if you make things easy for people, they'll do it. Uh, picking up again on Supriya's example there, Mike, the, the bureaucracy inside government, how helpful or not are they to the mission that she just described? Well, I, I think they can be. I think there, there's a generational uh, change going right now in the bureaucracy. So I, I just got out of my year uh, with the federal government. And there's, there's a lot of bright 20-somethings now, now in there. I think there was a lot of opportunity created back, back in the 1990s and early 2000s when the federal government was trying to balance the books. There wasn't a lot of hiring going on. Uh, and we've kind of made up for that in the last few years. So I do see some optimism. You know, I do see the, those mid-20s as they come through the chain. I think they're going to develop the ideas that they learned in university that, you know, I didn't get to, to learn back in the 1990s.
you're, you're into cutting edge stuff. Mm -hmm. And governments are into doing it kind of the old fashioned way. I mean, you're, you're introducing new ideas and new principles that they're just not really ready for yet. Is that I possible? It's possible. I think they're getting ready. I think there are definitely parts of government that are not just open, but are on this journey themselves. And I think those are the parts of government that we need to target and help you know, propel the mission forward. Mike, it's one thing to, to introduce these ideas into the public service. I mean, you left yeah. the public service as well, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Are they just not really ready to hear this information? I, I, I think it depends on, on department to department. And part of it's due to risk. So I was at ISA, the innovation, what used to be called Industry Canada. I think it was a little bit easier for us because we were you know, giving grants to companies and that kind of thing and we can fail. You know, It's a little bit different if you're in health or, or education or, or agriculture where if you design something poorly, you know, people die or the crops fail or, mm. or, or something on, on that end. So I think that's where we have to start is uh, in areas where, you know, if we get something wrong, if we, we, we do these tests, we might be at a little bit, a little bit of money, but you know, that's nothing catastrophic happens. So I think it's those line departments that can be a little bit creative on designing policy, a little bit creative on, on procurement. Um, you know, using procurement dollars to enhance innovation, I think they can be a little bit more creative than you would want in, say, health or education or any but, of those departments. Theoretically, though, if we're going to make any advances in these areas that we've been talking about, we ought to have a treasure trove of research and information upon which to make these decisions. Do we? Not, not at the moment. Uh, no, I think there has to be more uh, that goes on, both with, within the bureaucracy and out, outside, I think. And I, I would agree with Philip that a lot of this is contextual, all right? So there's, you know, you really only are able to do these things through doing pilot projects and A-B testing and things like that. And I think that's one of the big lessons from behavioral economics is unlike traditional neoclassical economics, it's not sort of a theory of everything, that uh, our, our information is contextual. So it's just going to be through experimentation and trying new things. And we're never, it's going to be iterative. We're never going to completely figure this out. Can I just, yeah, please. I'd, I'd like to, I mean, so I, to an extent I agree, to an extent I'd sort of like to contest that point because, so in the UK, for instance, there are now nine what are called what works centers. And they're, the premise is, can we aggregate data from a, a number of different policy contexts and other places, other contexts, which have tried to solve a certain problem? And what have we learned from you know, all of these different contexts that we can now apply without having to do a randomized control trial every single time. I'm a scientist. I'm all for doing experiments. At the same time, governments are not always going to be able to invest the resources, or, or, or other you know, institutions are not always going to be able to run an experiment. There are going to be times when you, you need to apply an insight. Whether or not that is right to do is dependent on how strong that insight is. So for example, to go back to my earlier point about if we start thinking about policy making as problem solving, where we, what we are addressing is a particular behavior, it might be the case that the specific program that we are testing has not been tested elsewhere. But mm -hmm. it is also quite possible that the deeper, there's a deeper evidence base for the behavior of interest that already exists that I can turn to. Cool. An example of this is, for instance, so, so to go back to our thing about you know, drugs, um, so if, if I want to send, if I want to in, encourage physicians to tell their patients to get the flu vaccine, and uh, I'm thinking what, what, I, what I want to do is tell them, in, give them information about how many of their peer physicians are telling their patients to get the flu vaccine. And you know, so basically co competition or social norming or tell them to do it that way. Mm -hmm. I might not have information about whether or not anybody else has done that or whether or not that has worked. But the deeper insight is that people generally care about what their peers are doing yes. and are likely to do what their peers are doing. Mm -hmm. So I can draw on that evidence base and I can bring, bring it to bear to my context. I mean, sometimes this is a bit harder to do because those more sort of theoretical constructs are academic and are not necessarily accessible you know, in, in public policy forums or contexts. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's important, I think, for for uh, the public sector to collaborate more, more strongly with academics and bring in scientists and build capacity so we are actually able to use 
the wealth of knowledge that is already out there. In which case, in our last 30 seconds here, Dilip, let me ask you, what hopes do you have that more institutions across our society are going to buy into this new way of thinking? I'm, I'm very optimistic. I think mm -hmm. uh, we now have at last count at least 50 to 60 governments, government units all over the world that have actually started behavioral insight teams. And I think Supriya is right. I think as long as we have willingness to share data and insights and build up a data set. And so we're certainly building up one here uh, at the University of Toronto, uh, but there are several other centers where we can start now sharing our successes and failures and develop these general principles. I think it just becomes easier for governments to now take that next step and do the fine tune. That's Dilip Soman from the Rotman School at the University of Toronto, Supriya Ciel, former chief behavioral scientist at the Government of Canada's Privy Council Office, and Mike Moffat, innovation, trade, and regulatory expert Canada 2020, all-around good guy. It's great to have you three here at TVO tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Pleasure. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.